824 on the morning show. I'm Peter Miller. Busy traffic out there right now. It is bumper to bumper rush hour traffic, but be patient. You'll get there. Hi everyone, I'm Bill Kelly, and yes, this is Land and Sea. Bear with us, we're trying to make a point to all those city drivers picking their way through the urban jungle. People who sometimes think there's nothing worse than navigating the rush hour traffic. Snarled up bumper to bumper, dodging pedestrians and the other fellow's muffler. So you think you got it rough, huh? Well, we're here to suggest you don't know what rough is, but you're about to get a crash course. Now this is rough. Granted, no big deal for your typical fisherman. Just another day at the office. But much rougher than it ever gets on dry land. Out here, there's no nice black top, no dividing lines. And a big rock could be lurking just below the water line. No, sir, this is definitely not your average highway. Welcome aboard. We call tonight's story charting the roughest highway of all, the waters of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a highway Skipper Seas Pitcher has traveled for 45 years. He knows her well, especially this part of the coast near his home port of heart's content, Trinity Bay. He knows every rock, every shoal, every ledge, and every channel. And he knows them every bit as well as you know your own back garden. But when Seas Pitcher ventures afar, as most longliner fishermen must these days, it's a different story. And he'd no sooner steam into strange waters without his charts then your average motorist would set out for parts unknown without a road map. You've got to have charts aboard of a boat. You haven't got charts aboard of a boat, you can't go anywhere. It's all right now there and where you know is the place, but if you go into strange waters, you certainly got to have charts. You've got to be foolish to go out without charts. You take equipment, you know, equipment breaks down. And if equipment breaks down, you can have the best kind of equipment aboard if it breaks down, well, you, you certainly got to have charts to, to know where you're going. You go in on the land in night and in wind and fog and one thing or another, you haven't got a chart, you're lost. You know, there's no way you can, uh, you can go on. If, for example, Seas Pitcher were to wind up here in Smoky, one of the busiest fishing centers on the Labrador coast, he'd be lost for sure without a proper map. That's a minefield down there. Well, if Smoky's a minefield, this is a minesweeper, the Canadian hydrographic ship Maxwell, 30 years in the service of mariners. Uh, Victor Hotel Delta, this is Maxwell, go ahead. That's Captain Julian Goodyear, and as both chief hydrographer and master of the ship, he not only makes the charts, he depends on them too. We will uh, bring in the batteries and things to uh, deploy the transponders this evening as well, over. Okay, we'll check that, Julian. The last time a survey was done here in Smoky was over 30 years ago. A new one is badly needed. Port 108. 108. At that time when the survey was done in Smoky, we didn't have the volume of shipping or the tonnage of shipping either. There's a new uh, facility in Smoky and you're getting larger vessels ranging from the longliner fleet up to the uh, tanker. We have uh, Marine Atlantic that runs uh, numerous vessels in here. Then we have the various coastal freighters and the tankers. During the time of this survey, there was not as much traffic. And that's the reason why we're here doing a new chart for the Smoky area. The chart, the, the, the product that we're, we're here to make, is a legal document. The mariners rely on it quite heavily. And uh, I think there's that gut feeling all the time with both the hydrographers and the crew that uh, the importance of maintaining uh, good high standards, uh, obtaining accurate data, and portraying this information in a proper fashion on board the chart. I think. Uh, from the early days of hydrography, the early explorers knew that when they came back into an area that they must uh, have good information so they uh, made sure that when they're in an area they covered what the mariner needed to get into a, a particular port or go through a, a particular channel. We'll leave ourselves about three cables. That looks pretty good there, I think. A native of Carmenville, 
Captain Goodyear comes from a long line of mariners. My grandfather uh, was a sea captain. My father went to sea with him, and they carried cargo around the coast of Newfoundland. Skippers, you're blowing a real gale there now, eh? Yes, it's blowing a nice breeze out there now. It's blowing about, uh, about 35, gusting to 40 right now. Weather's well, not supposed to be very good tomorrow either, eh? No, it's calling for uh, fog and rain tomorrow. So you're going to try to get a jump on it tonight, is that it? We're going to try to get our transponders out tonight so we'll have positioning to send the launches away in the morning. I see, so the weather won't affect you in any way? No, the weather won't affect us. Uh, once we have our uh, electronic positioning systems up, uh, we should obtain good positioning and be able to run the launches tomorrow. That's the plan, but can they do it? It's nearly 6 p.m. There are just a few hours of daylight left. Will there be enough time? The skipper decides to anchor the Maxwell just off Smokey for the night. And that's the signal for the whole crew to swing into action. There's a lot to do and not much time to do it. Uh, we got one up here. I got a transponder here. The transponders, or radio beacons that transmit electronic signals, are critical to the survey. And several of the ship's hydrographers and their helpers are waiting for them at a makeshift helicopter pad on that point of land just across the way. And there's the chopper, right on time. It's critical too, because the transponders must be set up on the highest points of land in the area. The chartered helicopter runs a kind of shuttle service around the nearby hills, dropping off one hydrographic team, picking up another. The pilot will make 30 to 40 landings and takeoffs in all. He's up and down like a dog's breakfast. It's not hard to see why the chopper is so important to this part of the survey. What the hydrographers are doing in a couple of hours tonight would take weeks if they had to climb those hills and hike over that terrain. The guy with the beard is Graham Rankin, an experienced hydrographer. The younger fellow is Scott Brown, a student on a work term from the Marine Institute in St. John's. One day, he hopes to become a captain himself, and he's finding his first summer at sea a real learning experience. It's a very good ship for a student coming on board. We get a lot of uh, responsibility for one thing, the skipper likes to uh, give us young students some responsibility. We get to do a lot of different things. We get to do a lot of navigation, um, help the hydrographers. It's an interesting, interesting job. The wind up here tonight is enough to cut you in two, more like December than July. And the boys have gone way past their normal supper time. They're cold and hungry. They'll have to deal with the cold themselves, but there's no worries about grub. Back at the ship, is a guy who specializes in taking care of man-sized appetites. I'm going to make a little bit of crust over the top, using just ordinary water. Now we're going to have a beautiful crust on a homemade bread. we got spaghetti meat sauce for supper. Let me try it. More salt, a little bit more salt. And the salt. Now, let's see how they taste now. Fantastico. <laughs> si, senor. Second choice, I got today a homemade beans. 
supposed to be a, a Newfoundland dish. Uh -huh. Well, I am from Europe, but I don't know if I might. And I'm gonna give you just a little bit. Yes, I so you are from Newfoundland. Uh -huh. I'm gonna give you a little bit for taste. Oh, Here you are. I'm not mm. a big fan of uh, baked beans. Oh, but, they uh, passed the tester. Is it? Mm -hmm. Well, there must, be, there must be Newfoundland molasses. <laughs> That's it. Turn a little bit. Now, Wes, we can complain about the weather. Not yeah. the best today. But we hear no complaints about the food on the ship. Well, I don't know. You just stay with me a couple of days. <laughs> so it's very hard to say. But uh, besides that, I'm going to have a Caesar salad mm -hmm. and a lemon pie meringue. Oh, sounds great. For dessert. We're going to see. I'm going to serve up everything, and we'll see. How is everything? Oh, I'm sure. In your eyes. I'm sure it'll be great. Okay. I was going to ask you, by the way, you come from Poland originally? Yes. And you came to Newfoundland, what, three years ago? Uh, yes. Uh, right now I got house in St. John's. Uh -huh. So probably I'm going to stay for another couple of years. Good. A good move. You enjoy Newfoundland? Yes. There is a different people. And uh, really, I was in so many uh, provinces across Canada. And uh, I'm really, uh, I would say, uh, beautiful people. And you're enjoying your time on the ship here? Eh? Yes, well, working hard, but uh, still happy. Good crew? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. We're going to sit back now and wait for dinner to be served. OK, thank you, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, plate, when you're ready, Brian, please. Anyone who's ever gone to sea knows the importance of a good cook. He can make or break morale, and in some ways, he's the most important person on the ship. Captain Julian Goodyear thinks so, and he ought to know. We have a, a fantastic cook here. Uh, I think he was born for show business, our cook. <laughs> <laughs> he makes sure that everybody gets uh, uh, their favorite meal cooked at least once a week. And uh, in an area like this, you know, where there's not much to look forward to, uh, the meal of the day, especially in the evening after the boys come back, after beating around all day in the launches, uh, a good meal is important. It's nearly time to call it a day. But aboard the Maxwell, Captain Goodyear and his senior staff never end one day without planning the next. It's the skipper's way. This entrance coming up this way is not that popular. There's not that much water in there. We'll worry about this first, and then we'll take this Later. Let's complete everything from the entrance here down to here before we worry about, it, about these approaches. And we'll worry about the sounding down here and here last. Okay, that's it. Moving in, what time? 10 minutes. Moving in 10 minutes? And we'll see you down there. It's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap? Like the man said, it's a wrap, but only temporarily. We're all coming back right after the break. Welcome back to the MV Maxwell in Smoky Labrador. It's early morning, the crew is up and at it, and as Captain Julian Goodyear explains, it'll be another busy day. All hands are uh, on deck by 8 o'clock, and, and the first order of the day, of course, is to get our workhorses, the, the survey launches over the side. And uh, as you can see, uh, the boys are quite busy right now, and uh, I would say about 10 minutes, both boats will be in the water and they'll be ready to put uh, the electronic equipment and the personnel will be going on board the boat for the day. We normally work uh, about a 12-hour day. Uh, the boys start, uh, as I said earlier, uh, around 8 o'clock in the morning, and, and they normally come back 6.30, 7 o'clock, sometimes as late as 9 and 10 o'clock at night. Okay, Duffy, today I want you to uh, go up to Emily Harbor here and put in the tide gauge, okay? And uh, there are some benchmarks there from an old survey, so you'll have to recover the, the datum, the existing datum, and also make arrangements to put in some additional ones. Okay, so if there's only one there, do you want me to put the gauge in anyway? Yes, okay. put the gauge in, recover the datum, and uh, then we'll establish the two other benchmarks. Teamwork and preparation are the watchwords around here. The skipper is a real stickler for detail. Richard, you and I and Graham today will be uh, basically concerned with doing the computations for the control. Okay, 
Sean Duffy and his team are off to install the all-important tide gauge. Sean is a veteran hydrographer, and there isn't much of the Newfoundland and Labrador coastline he hasn't seen in his 10 years or more aboard the Maxwell. Duffy's coxswain, or launch driver, is Lou Jacobs, an old sea daddy from Rodington. Lou's an expert seaman, a good guy too. Fellows like Lou are the backbone of any ship. Without them, you might as well leave her tied up at the wharf. Uh, launch Mallard, Launch Mallard, Maxwell, Maxwell, radio check, you read over. Maxwell, Mallard, reading 11 clear, hanging over. Uh, Roger, 11 clear. Union cards, boys, before we leave for the carpenters and joiners. Yes, we'll be arrested. Well, no, they have nothing to fear when they see us. <laughs> the tide gauge uh, records on chart paper the continuous record, the water level throughout the day. Uh, they're building a shelter that. Uh, will protect the gauge from the wind, the rain, and, and uh, make sure that uh, nothing gets wet inside. One of the major uh, problems in hydrography is tides. The reason we want to know the tides are so that our depths are reduced, uh, so that when low tide, uh, we have the correct sounding. Because uh, if we took all high tide depths, when the tide went uh, down, then maybe uh, a danger may be exposed and a ship will come and hit a rock or something like that. While Duffy and his crew finish installing the tide gauge, a team of divers from the Maxwell starts a visual inspection of the ocean floor around the local wharf. Sometimes uh, we get objects on the bottom that we can't uh, figure out what they are, and uh, sometimes a visual inspection is necessary, and, and as you're well aware, the best way to do that it is with a diver, and we go down and verify and prove or disprove the information. Not far away, another team of hydrographers begins sounding in Smoky Tickle. The challenge for Cox and Peter Buffett of Fortune is to get as close to the rocks as he can without tearing the bottom out of the launch. Now, if you think that's easy and you've got lots of insurance, try it sometime. This is a. Uh... That's okay, yeah. A graphical view at the bottom, eh? Mm -hmm. The bottom we just served, we just done a line, like on the chart, I'll just show you now. Right. Like here in Smoky Tickle, we just run a line from probably, well, about here to here, eh? Right. And we do these in 50 meter line spacing, eh? Uh-huh. Like this gives us a graphical view of the bottom here, the bottom of the ocean, or the bottom of the sea, eh? Right. And uh, so we take this in, we plot the soundings on a chart, mm -hmm. and we do these 50 meter line spacings. If yeah, we see anything extraordinary, like a shoal or rock or anything, we'll go back and search it, you know, and make sure that is the depth there, eh? You go right to the rocks there, Peter. Now, this area is quite tricky for mariners, and there's all kinds of rocks. And... Yeah, it is indeed, yeah. There's actually a lot of the work we do is pretty tricky, eh? So I guess by the time you're finished, it'll be a lot less tricky for, for the guys. Oh, yeah, it should be. Yeah. They'll, know, uh, yeah. they'll know a lot more about what's going oh, yeah. on. Yeah. An hour ago here, it was freezing cold and blowing a gale. Now it's quite warm, perfectly calm. But more than that, we've got fog, rain, the sun is peeping through, and blue sky in the background. What a country. Incredible, isn't it? Makes you wonder, you know, where Jack Cartier's mind, not to mention his eyes, must have been when he scornfully referred to Labrador as the land God gave to Cain. 
Aren't you glad we're all Cain's children? What a country. Well, these are the field notes that were gathered for the survey crews on each of the stations. Uh, the Down below in the bowels of the ship, oblivious to breathtaking scenery and spectacular sunsets, the senior hydrographer and his men are sifting through a mountain of data gathered during the day and feeding it into the Maxwell's onboard computer system. We have to check these over carefully, mean the numbers, uh, put a summary page at the front of each, and those have to be checked again. So there's two signatures on every one of these. Who did it? Who checked it? And then we start doing the processing. We do it by hand first to make sure there are no large errors, and then we enter in a, the entire works into the GHOST program, and that will do the very fine adjustments, give us the uh, second and third decimal place exactly the way it will eventually be used. As a branch of science, hydrography has made staggering advances over the past two decades. But Captain Goodyear predicts developments over the next few years will be even more significant. When I came here in 1971, uh, basically the hydrographer carried uh, two sextants and an echo sounder uh, with a notebook and a few pencils in the survey launch. And uh, today we have uh, and electronic positioning systems uh, in the launches that uh, can, uh, can do as much as the electronic positioning systems that we have for the vessel. And uh, the, the, the whole concept of data acquisition has changed. Uh, we're getting into the digital era, uh, whereby uh, quite a bit of the information is collected and processed digitally for better manipulation. And yes, we, we have seen quite a number of change in the past 20 years. And I suppose we'll see a whole lot more over the next five or ten even. Yes, I think uh, the changes in the mapping world in general over the next five years will be very dramatic. In some ways, the future is already here. At the coming out party in Victoria, B.C. for the Matthew, a new generation of hydrographic ship taking over from the Maxwell on the East Coast service. The Matthew is state of the art, the equal of anything in the mapping world. But for all that, Captain Goodyear leaves his old command with mixed feelings. It's nice to see, uh, you know, the, the new vessel with uh, the, all of the, the new equipment, the new facilities on board, the modern equipment. But when you sit back and reminisce a little, you know, it is a little sad to see the old girl go. The Maxwell there, she's been around for 30 years. And I think uh, there's a lot of pleasant memories there for a lot of uh, crew members, a lot of sailors, a lot of hydrographers throughout Canada. In time, no doubt, Captain Goodyear and his men will come to love the Matthew too. But the venerable old Maxwell will always have a treasured place in their hearts. Good night, everyone, from Smoky, Labrador. <laughs>